To you who eat a lot of rice because you're lonely. To you who sleep a lot because you're bored. To you who cry a lot because you are sad, I write this down. Chew on your feelings that are cornered like you would chew on rice. Anyway, life is something that you need to digest. Chun Yong Hee. Welcome to this week's episode of Warfare, Advancement, and Revisionism. My name is Preston Floyd, and as always, I'm your host. I'd like to thank everyone for joining me this week. Uh, to any newcomers, welcome, and for returning listeners, thank you again, as always. Um, had no, January is still going pretty strong in terms of uh, listeners and downloads. Uh, seems like we've got a lot of new people joining us, probably from iTunes. So uh, again, welcome. I uh, do hope you guys will enjoy the show, and uh, we'll go back through the back catalog. Um, we surpassed 3,000 downloads through all of the audio only um, formats. Um, I think it was actually last week. I didn't note it until uh, until after I had recorded the episode, but uh, which is great. Uh, we had a thousand downloads in the first year, and then we doubled it up, and then as uh, just in time for. The second anniversary of the podcast, we have doubled uh, listeners and downloads from the previous year. So, uh, and that's not even including YouTube stuff. So, uh, again, thank you all. I really appreciate it. Uh, but uh, in terms of feedback, specifically about last week's episode, um, I did have a question in regards to um, apple cider and. I was not sure uh, specifically of when that would have been, Uh, and I went and looked it up, and it appears, at least at the first historical description of what would be called apple cider, is actually uh, right around the time that Julius Caesar was alive. Uh, I think he made a reference to it in his writings uh, that the Celtic uh, peoples were... Um, in Britain specifically, we're making cider from the crab apples there, um, which, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, apple ciders are still very popular in England and in parts of America, and they were extremely popular, you know, in early American colonial periods. And um, honestly, that makes sense because they're, uh, you know, they're growing it in places where grapes, you know, typically were not found. Uh, so while wine had a very strong hold on the Mediterranean basin, uh, you know they're they're fermenting uh, different types of fruits uh, that grow natively to make uh, more alcoholic beverages. It makes sense at least. Um, but uh, I need to read up on the actual archaeology, ar- uh, excuse me, archaeology of the stuff to know for sure. But um, at least historically speaking, the earliest reference we have is uh, right before the turn into the. Uh, uh, common era or AD period um, before we have writings of it. Though I'm sure, you know, native Britons were probably making uh, some type of uh, fermented alcohol for much longer uh, than, you know, just the 55 BCs. So, um, but that being said, that's the only little bit of uh, feedback I had from the last episodes. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move on to plant domestication in East and Southeast Asia between 6,000 and 4,000 BC. Um, Mostly. Uh, A couple of our crops might have been fully domesticated prior to the season, Uh, but that's debated, hence why I didn't definitively include them last season. Um, So this episode we're going to try and talk about that as much as possible. and then we'll try to move on to some other uh, later crops. And I say try because um, there's a lot of different uh, crops in these parts of Asia that are going through domestication events or, you know, have just finished domestication events. Um, uh, And because there's so many, it might take me a week or two. Um, But we're going to be talking about things, of course, like rice, um, a couple different types of millet, uh, soybeans, bananas, uh, water chestnuts, perea, uh, burdock, things like that. And we will get through what we can this week and then cover the rest um, next episode. And hopefully uh, 
that will be enough, just these two episodes, so we can go ahead and get uh, into Europe and then the Americas. So, let's go ahead and get started with the most influential of these crops, that being rice. Now, the ultimate origin for the name rice in every European language comes from Greek. Uh, English got it via Old French's ris, uh, which came from the Italian riso, uh, which descended from the Latin oriza, itself a form of the Greek oriza, or oriza as well. It's just spelled slightly differently. Now, there is a bit of a mystery uh, who the Greeks got the word from. Uh, we do know it came from an Indo-Iranian language, but we're not 100% sure which one. That's very heavily debated. Of course, in the grand scheme of things, I, I don't think it really matters, um, as most likely any of those Indo-Iranian tongues picked it up from the Sanskrit word for rice. Uh, excuse me, uh, vris, uh, I believe is how it's pronounced, uh, V-R-I-H-I-S. Uh, now, I talked about rice a lot last season at a couple of sites over, you know, different places in East Asia due to the nature of um, rice's grains and their size. Determining when the plant became fully domesticated is an extremely difficult uh, process, especially from just, you know, eyeballing the grains. Hence why part of the reason I was hesitant to talk about it last season when we were talking about domesticated crops. Um, but some newer articles uh, that I've read since that part now um, kind of um, uh, make me think at least that rice has been domesticated before the start of this season. I think it was probably um, at some point during last season. Though I do need to point out that there is more and more evidence for separate domestication events for this crop. And I'm not only talking about Asian rice with that I say this, I'm talking about Africa. Uh, they have their own species of rice that they domesticate there. Uh, but that won't be domesticated until much later. I can say that definitively. Um, and the scientific name for Asian rice is Oriza sativa. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, um, that being said, while rice uh, was probably domesticated in a couple different places, um, they're all basically working uh, from the same original strain uh, of Ariza sativa. And there's since then, there's been a lot of um, uh, back pollination and, you know, different groups working with the same sources and trading them and so it kind of also kind of makes things a little difficult to suss out now uh, today there are two primary sub variants of this crop and that's uh, japonic or seneca and indica now for a long time it was believed that the crop was first domesticated somewhere along the yangtze valley and spread out from there however there is some mounting evidence that this is very again simplistic and too simplistic for it to you know make sense. Uh, it appears that the harvest of wild rice began in kind of the border region between uh, Southeast Asia, the Indian subcontinent, and southern China, and then you know it spread out from there to the neighboring regions, uh, you know, in similar directions, you know, in the, to all those kind of directions. Um, First, it would have moved into what is now central and northern China, somewhere between 8,000 and 5,000 BC. And then it would have moved into the Ganges River Delta between 6,500 and 2,500 BC. Now, if what was being spread into those regions was a true domesticated strain or a semi-wild strain is, again, very difficult to tell. Um, what Ever the exact case, both of those regions I mentioned will develop their rice strains to fit uh, their needs and their environments. Uh, these strains are then sent back to the original range of wild variants and then again into new regions from there. Um, the primary northern Chinese strain is the Japonic or again the Seneca variety. Um, Japonic of course being 
the Japanese and Seneca being kind of like the Latinization of China. Sino, uh, if you ever heard of like the Sino um, Japanese War or something along those lines, that's that's where that's from. Um, and then, of course, the primary strain from the Ganges Delta is the Indi Indican variety. Excuse me. Now, both of these strains have their own offshoots as well, and a lot of these strains have been crossbred with each other at various times. Again, just trying to kind of make that clear. Now, the primary differences between the various strains are uh, grain size, shape, color, consistency of the grains themselves, and, of course, their preferred environments. Uh, Japonica rice tends to have smaller, rounder, thicker grains. They also tend to be stickier, depending on you know, the strains again. Uh, and Japonica can also be grown in dry fields or wet fields. That being said, though, uh, Indica does have you know wet and dry places where the, the rice is grown. They can both be grown that way. However, from my understanding and my reading on the situation, most of the um, Indica strains uh, are grown uh, dry and allowed to be um, watered by you know rain and things like that. Although, of course, there are places where that is not the case. Uh, depending on people's customs. Um, there are parts of India where it's a monsoon crop, you know, that they want those rains to come in and kind of, you know, get the dry fields just through rainfall and things like that. And then there are places along the coast, I think, that allow the tides to come in and things like that. Um, so, um, but I think it is more likely to see... Um, at least, again, from my kind of general understanding, it's more likely that you'd see uh, more uh, wet field uh, uh, planting and harvesting with japonica rice than you would see dry field. And whereas indica, there's more of a balance to them, I would say. Uh, at least that's kind of what I got from it. Uh, now, there are um, there are some other uh, differences. Um there are, um, to Japonica, it also has temperate and tropical variants. Uh, I think uh, the tropical variants were grown in certain places like the Philippines uh, in the past. Now, uh, indica strains tend to have more oval-shaped grains, and they're also larger. Uh, they also tend to be uh, light and fluffy, uh, not quite as hard when you bite into them. Uh, and the Indican strains are usually what people in Western Eurasia and North America are familiar with. Uh, though, of course, you know, with increased global trade and things like that and immigration um, of Asian communities out of Asia uh, to, again, Western Eurasia and North America, South America, you'll, you'll see that uh, more uh, there's more availability for Asian style rice um, than there have been in the past. Um, you know, when I was a kid growing up, no one would have had that anywhere close to me. But now, even though I, I've moved up to a slightly larger city, um, you know, we now have actual Asian grocery stores. So you could find that kind of thing. And even certain smaller grocery stores now have, you know, um, foreign food sections. They'll have either like um, uh, Latin American uh, type ingredients or Asian type ingredients, even if that grocery store doesn't specialize in said items. Um, now, I also want to caution people that while most people think of rice kind of as the ultimate crop of East Asia, um, this has historically not always been the case, and I think people might be surprised um, how late this change comes about in human history. Now, uh, we will discuss that you know, at certain periods of times, other crops will be much more important and more widely grown. Uh, and then um, there are a number of reasons for this, but one of the earliest factors is that uh, earlier Japonica strains of rice were not well suited to the colder temperatures of northern East Asia. So it was grown in much smaller amounts. Uh, both uh, in terms of number of plants and in terms of area that the seeds were being spread. Uh, 
Uh, it is only with um, breeding and evolution of the various um, Japonica strains that rice production in those regions becomes much more uh, productive and prevalent. Now, aside from rice, uh, there are two other variants of millet uh, that are being or have been domesticated in Asia during this season. We have proso millet and foxtail millet. Now, these are very distantly related to sorghum. All three belong to the same scientific classification up to family, and they really only differ in their genus and species. Now, proso millet appears to have been first domesticated uh, of the two Asian uh, strains of um, millet, excuse me. Uh, possibly as much as uh, 2,000 years earlier. So somewhere between 8,000 and 6,000 BC. Uh, Prosa millet is the primary crop grown by the Neolithic Sishan culture of northern China. And I mentioned them last week and we will talk about them more later this season. Uh, now Prosa millet grew wild throughout not just northern East Asia, but also in northern latitudes back west toward Europe as far as the Caspian Sea. Uh, the name Proso is Slavic in origin and means millet, literally. There are um, also a number of names that are used for it in English, such as, again, broom corn, which is shared between it and sorghum. Um, you may also see it called pig millet or hog millet, and sometimes it's just, just called millet. The Chinese name for the crop is mi mi, uh, both mi's, and that's M-I, are written with different characters. Uh, the first can actually mean to rot or waste, uh, and the other character means rice. Uh, now, I'm not sure why these characters were used to form that name. Uh, as far as I can tell, Proso tastes fine. Uh, it, I just wasn't able to get an answer as to why this name came about. Uh, I do have a couple of guesses. Um, the most likely things that I can think of is that it was because it was often used for uh, fermentation and pickling, or it may have been because unlike japonica rice, the grains are not sticky, so maybe the grains texture made people think of old uh, rice. Um, I think uh, as the grains kind of sit out on japonica, they kind of lose some of their, uh, their stickiness. If any uh, listeners have uh, are familiar with Chinese and you know their naming conventions, uh, let me know if you know why uh, that that is uh, used to describe prosa millet. Uh, the general name for millet in Chinese is Xiaomi or Guzi or Guji. I'm not sure how that or Guja. I think as another way it could be pronounced. Uh, the character Zhao means small, and the character Gu means grain, uh, and Zi means child. So uh, Xiaomi is literally small uh, rice, and Gu Zi is um, uh, 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 excuse me, uh, young grain, essentially. Uh, Xiaomi is typically used for um, to describe grains that have been uh, harvested and uh, shelled, you know, and just gone through the process to remove the shell from the grains themselves. And guzi means the uh, unharvested, unshelled grains, the ones that are still growing on the crop. Um, now, uh, several Indian languages uh, like Hindi, Bengali, Gujarati refer to proso millet as china or chino, or something very, very similar to those words. So um, it's very clear that the Indian uh, people associate proso millet with coming from China. Now, uh, proso can grow very quickly. Uh, it can become harvestable as quickly as in 45 days. Uh, it's very hardy and can be grown with very little water. Um, and you can plant it um, between uh, and harvested between crops um, that you say you grow some crops in the late spring, early summer. Uh, and 
you could also do it for those that are planted in late summer and early fall. So you would essentially you'd kind of place them between your larger, um, more I guess profitable crops or your crops that take longer to grow. Um, it's very similar to rye in that case. So you could be a it could be like an early winter harvest or like an extremely early um, or excuse me, in this extremely uh, late spring harvest. Uh, and it's very similar to rye in that fashion. It's kind of used to kind of, I guess, cleanse uh, the field or, you know, keep it, keep it from getting overtaken by uh, unedible weeds or extremely nasty weeds too, I guess. Uh, though, of course, like rye, you do have to be careful that it kind of doesn't escape containment and revert uh, to maybe other fields you don't want to have anything in, or that um, if it's not uh, properly cared for, it can kind of, um, I guess, revert to a, a slightly more wild variation of Proso. So it is a little uh, bit difficult to deal with that. Um and, you know, that can make it um, take up more space than you want, but it can also help certain kinds of pests spread that you maybe don't want as well. So um, I think some people also think that the wild varieties that grow in uh, the places I mentioned earlier, you know, from the northern latitudes out to the Caspian Sea, um, some people think that that just might be escaped versions of various domesticated strains or semi-domesticated strains that just broke containment and just uh, kind of reverted to more wild, um, a wilder period of their evolution. Uh, but again, that's all debated. Now, uh, the next millet we have is foxtail millet. Uh, and again, it was uh, domesticated slightly later than Proso, also by the Sea Shan peoples. However, it uh, doesn't become the most widely grown millet until later, and a different culture kind of. Um, kind of, uh, I guess, pushes its importance up. Um, and then after that point, it becomes the primary food stuff of northern China for quite a while until wheat arrives. Uh, and even after wheat gets to the area um, that uh, foxtail millet is growing in, it still, you know, it still takes up a, a sizable portion of the um, you know, jet, uh, excuse me, Chinese diets and things like that. It's still it's still a valuable crop. It's just not um, the most widely grown, but it's it's fairly close in terms of importance. Now, um, this of course does take a couple thousand years for for that uh, you know for that process to happen. So millet uh, basically for. Um, for all of this season and probably the next season as well is going to be the primary uh, crop grown in China. And uh, I think even once we arise, there's another thousand years. So it might be another two seasons after this. Uh, I think wheat gets to China at somewhere around 2500 BC, um, give or take. Um Although I, I should probably double check that <laughs> to know for sure, but I, obviously we'll we'll make sure before we get there again. Um, now, um, once it uh, kind of becomes the um, primary crop, or excuse me, the primary millet in China, it uh, it takes a little bit, but it uh, becomes the default Asian millet. Um, so. Anywhere that grows millet, they're probably growing foxtail more than anything else. And that's not just China. That's everywhere in uh, Asia. Uh, and uh, it remains so, of course, to today. Uh, it, um, and one of the reasons it does this is that unlike proso millet, uh, it deals with heat a lot better. And this allows it to go into places... Uh, like Southeast Asia and India. Uh, and I know in Southeast Asia specifically, uh, it can be grown in drier regions, uh, like on mountains that don't necessarily see a lot of precipitation. Uh, and there's no, like, you know, irrigation available, or at least not enough irrigation to 
comfortably grow a good amount of rice. So foxtail allows agriculture to spread to those regions as well. Um, in southern India, it's an uh, extremely important crop because of, again, the environment there. Uh, it makes it a fantastic winter crop. Uh, you, you plant it and then harvest it, uh, it uh, kind of in the, uh, the winter, uh, kind of mid to late winter, and then you'd be able to harvest it in the early spring, leaving plenty of time for you to get your, uh, your better, um, or at least your more um, traditional uh, crops in. Um, it also, of course, moves to the north and to the uh, west as well, uh, and the east. Uh, it gets to places like Korea and Japan uh, between a thousand and five hundred years before it gets into Southeast Asia. And of course, in Europe, it enters the region through Siberia. Uh, I think they have found seeds dating to sometime between two thousand and one thousand. BC, uh, where it was apparently cultivated in very small amounts uh, in the Middle East, but it, it got there late and even later for Europe proper. Um, I think um, for it to really kind of show up in the archaeological record, uh, it doesn't really enter in until around 500 BC. So um, it's not super popular until later. It just had to find its niche, I guess. Um, ah, as for the name, uh, foxtail comes from the way uh, millet bushels uh, bend down to resemble a foxtail. Um, the Chinese name for the plant is Su, uh, though again, or Su, maybe. Um, though again, Xiaomi or Guzi may be used as well if people don't know what kind of millet they're looking at. You know, someone who's just buying it at the grocery store, they probably wouldn't be able to tell. Uh, too much of a difference uh, between uh, the different varieties, you know, just by looking at them if they were just looking at the packaging. Uh, and the su character used in Mandarin is made up of uh, the Zhao character, which means horned or uh, spiny, uh, and it's stacked on top of the rice character Mi. So foxtail millet is, uh, or su, I should say, is literally spiny rice. Uh, now let's uh, yeah let's move on to soybeans. Um, now of course uh, soy comes into um, English from uh, Dutch. Um, the Dutch use the term soya. Uh, they got that term from the Japanese soyu or soyu, uh, which referred to the sauce. Um, the Chinese name was Shio. Uh, the bean itself is called Shi in Chinese. Uh, and uh, soybean domestication started before this season started, but how long ago isn't known. Uh, the latest it could have been... Um, uh, sorry, excuse me. The latest it, have, it could have become domesticated by would be 5,000 BC or so. Um, but again, it started just before this season, probably within the last 500 years of last season. Um, at the at the probably the the probably the earliest, I would believe. Um, now, uh, like of course the legumes grown in the Middle East, soybeans are a great source of protein. Uh, though in East Asia, there's um, a huge amounts of products that are made um, from fermenting the beans uh, so you're not eating them necessarily you know cooked directly you're you're doing something to them uh, or you're using them to help um, preserve certain types of food or create new ways of um, ingesting that protein uh, now, I'm not as familiar with Western Asian cuisine, but I'm not aware of kind of the same level of using beans for fermentation um, for these Western legumes. I'm sure it was done. In fact, I know it was done, but I'm not sure if it was done at this a very early stage in the agriculture. I think that's something that's probably um, that happens a little bit later. 
Now, uh, of course, you know, we know about, uh, or at least I think most people would know in the West about tofu and soy milk. Uh, those are some of the well-known um, methods um, outside of uh, Asia, you know, of how to use soybeans. Um, and, you know, how old those methods are uh, isn't exactly known, um, but it's probably slightly later than what we're talking about this season, but I'm sure that they're beginning to experiment, um, you know, with using these in pretty much every conceivable way you could imagine. Um, I believe that there is um, the um, the production of tofu, I think, is usually attributed to uh, a Chinese... Um, prince or uh noble um and that's dated to the han period uh i think in the sometime i can't remember which han which part of the han dynasty was i think it was the earlier han dynasty so it's like i believe it, i want to say it's like in the 200s to 100s bc uh it's it's usually considered to have been um at least that's the first recorded instance of it being made. In uh, Chinese, the uh, term for uh, tofu is uh, dofu. Uh, so, um, very similar, of course, and I'm sure that the Chinese got the name from... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sure the Japanese got the name from the Chinese um, term for the creation. Now, soy milk is one that's a little bit harder to nail down. Um, the earliest record of it is also Han Dynasty uh, China. However, I think that they have, um, I think there's a lot of evidence that it is much older than that. That's just when it was first uh, kind of um, laid out on, um, you know, how it was made. Um, but... Um, that's probably not surprising. It's something that could have been made for a period lost and then easily rediscovered. That kind of thing happens uh, quite regularly. But of course, tofu uh, is made from soy milk, so um, you know it, it would make sense that uh, tofu comes along a little bit later than soy milk. Oh, uh, one thing with rice, uh, one of its strengths. Uh, is that it does not have gluten. So if you have a gluten allergy, rice is an excellent alternative. There are other things you can use rice for aside from foods, or at least they're byproducts. Um, so, you know, rice is, of course, an extremely important crop in today's world and economy. I think it's the most widely grown uh, plant on earth right now, uh, even more than wheat. Uh, it definitely feeds more people than wheat, uh, at least uh, right now, uh, at least as the primary crop, I should say. Well, I think that is a good place to call it for this week. Uh, there are a couple of other smaller topics I could talk about. However, it mostly deals with stuff that's outside of the, the purview of this season. Uh, so it's it's probably better just to hang on to that kind of stuff for later. Uh, we'll be back next week. We should hopefully finish up uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia kind of crop domestication zones, uh, and then we'll move on. Uh, but if you guys have any feedback or just want to drop a comment, uh, you're welcome to either uh, email me at waradrevpod at gmail.com. You can send me a direct message on Twitter slash X. You could just tweet at me. Um, you can comment on the episode links I post weekly on Wednesdays. You can go to the YouTube channel. You can comment there on any of the uh, videos I've uploaded. Or you can just come into a live stream if I'm live and talk there. Uh, all are valid methods to reach out to me. Um, but yeah, um, I do know, uh, I got a message from RSS saying that, uh, the Google podcast service is being, uh, eliminated by Google. They are shutting that down. I'm assuming they're going to be, 
um, kind of rolling it into YouTube music. I don't know that for sure, but um, I have a I have a hard time believing Google's just dropping out of the podcast game entirely. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, but I know that there are a couple of listeners that use the Google Podcast stuff. Uh, it's not, you know, my most number of um, listeners, uh, but it, it's a decent chunk. So um, I hope you guys... I hope I'm not the one breaking this news to you. I hope you're aware of it. And if if I am, I do apologize if I was uh, a little too, um, I guess, uh, straightforward with it. I hope I didn't cause any emotional damage. Not that I imagine that's the case. But, um, yeah, uh, you can find me, of course, on plenty of other uh, platforms. Um, So hopefully uh, you guys can find another service you like. But, yeah, yeah. that's uh, that's where we'll call this episode. Thank you guys for stopping by. Hope you've enjoyed. I hope you have a good rest of your day and week. Whenever you're listening to this episode, I will see you all next time. Peace.